Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Vulcan. Vulcan. There will be no rad or phosphex in my legion. We shall fight wars humanely. Some things should be left in the dark age. Ferris. Oh cool. When are you going to stop burning people to death? Vulcan. I don't understand the question. Even the softest and sweetest heart was made by design for extreme battle. Having a soft heart in a cruel world is courage, not weakness. Vulcan. Akka the Lord of Drakes, the Hammer of Salvation, the Promethean Fire, the Black Dragon, and the Jolly Green Giant, is the Primarch of the Salamanders Chapter of Space Marines. He is notable for being a fuck awesome smith, and advancing a civilization from stone to the steel age in a matter of months, as well as being perhaps one of the only likable and brotair primarchs, a trait he shares with Sanguinius and Crusade-era Horus. He does not pity the dark elder fools who raided his planet. Like all primarchs, he was dropped on a far-flung planet as an infant, and worked his way to a position of power. Some Primarchs became powerful by being good at politics and bureaucracy, or by kicking enemy ass. Vulcan did it by being really fucking smart and murdering as many Dark Elder as he could find with massive hammers, both of which are fine occupations for a demigod. He also made some really cool stuff, which the Salamanders have been spending all of their free time trying to find. As Primarchs go, he's more or less tied with Sanguinius as being a shining example of this guy especially compared to some of them. Nevertheless, even Vulcan's niceties can be stretched to the limit. Case in point, the shenanigans that happened on the world of Caldera in the book Promethean Sun. Long story short, a bunch of humans, who were ironically, descendants of the folks kidnapped by the Dark Elder in Vulcan's youth, worshipped Elder Exodites as gods and protectors of this world. They were a bunch of weird Amish hippies. When the salamanders along with the Iron Hands and Death Guard came, they did with the usual imperial policy of join us or else. The humans there were incredibly stubborn and refused due to the actions and personalities of two particular individuals and, well, several misunderstandings and the intervention of Conrad Kurz of all things led to the whole mess spiraling out of control. This led to the infamous scene of Vulcan burning an elder child. However, Context is pretty fucking important. Conrad was pretty pissy at Vulcan's noble characteristic so he essentially set him up by blasting into a crowd of imprisoned Calderon humans and Exodites which, you know, created a fuck huge panic. Didn't really help that some of the folks that Vulcan had grown fond of on the campaign, including his own remembrancer, were killed in the crossfire. Vulcan was understandably incensed and lit up a surrendering Exodite in the heat, ahem and chaos of things. It should be noted that Vulcan after literally venting heat was horrified and disgusted at what he had done, even more so when he realized that his remembrancer died from a bolt round, which led the big V to deduce that the entire event was the Night Lord's doing, and he had been set up to look like a dick. Suffice to say, Kurz's trolling of Vulcan largely succeeded and was the catalyst that led to the unraveling between the big green and space Batman. As such, Vulcan was pretty fucking angry that he had been basically played like a fool and allowed the Night Lords to permanently stain his hands. After that incident, Vulcan learned from his past mistakes on Caldera and, case in point, let a bunch of Exodites live. He was also willing to work with Eldred in Old Earth. After the Horus heresy, he settled back on Caldera and vowed to protect the planet he had once literally burned to the ground to atone for his past sins there. Until the War of the Beast came knocking 1500 years later and things got weird. The only real chink in his moral armor is his out of control pyromania. When he banned the use of destroyers and other terror weapons within his legion as too cruel, Pharos Manus pointed out that burning people to death with flamers, vokite rays, and melter weaponry was hardly that much better. He wasn't wrong. But Vulcan was too busy setting a tank on fire with those boosted flamer pen rolls to notice. He is also a perpetual, which means that he regenerates from any injury, even the ones that actually kill him. With enough time, he can return from a death which vaporized him to atoms, find the culprit, 
and kick his sorry ass from one edge of the galaxy to the other. Conrad Kurz found this out the hard way. Unfortunately this has not been translated into tabletop rules, on the valid point that having a Primarch who is literally impossible to kill is slightly unfair. He inherited this ability from his father, which implies that the Emperor is a perpetual as well. This can provoke long and passionate debate. Never mind, the Emperor's status as a perpetual has since been confirmed and stated outright both in the Siege of Terror novel, Saturnine as well as GW itself by way of unfrequently asked questions posting. Pretty cool guy. Definitely cooler than his brothers. And also the hottest in a very little way. Ironic. Rather than be dumped in a volcano for being a bad omen, as is the fate of many small children who crash on feudal death worlds in space pods, Vulcan grew up as the adopted son of a blacksmith named N. Burl, from whom he learned the basics of metallurgy. Of course, being a genetically engineered super soldier like his brothers he reached adulthood at the age of 3 and started inventing new alloys like they were going out of style, bringing most of the planet up to the late steel age in a matter of months. Anyway, Vulcan enjoyed his normal life, or as close to normal as super strong basically demigod genius blacksmith could, until the Dark Elder came to town. Nocturne, it turns out, was a favorite raiding destination for mandrakes whose realm of Elandratch was connected to Nocturne by a series of webway gates. The populace, who had advanced to about the Iron Age before Vulcan came along, generally tended to hide from the space rapists with guns that shoot poisonous glass, but Vulcan didn't share their good sense, possibly having something to do with the fact that he could have tanked multiple RPG-7 rounds to the torso and only gotten mildly pissed off, but whatever. Instead, the first time they came after his arrival, he grabbed a pair of blacksmith's hammers and went to town on Spiss Elfas. If this sounds suspiciously familiar then congratulations, you're paying attention. If you also notice that Vulcan predates that character, making the other one the ripoff, then even better. We will make an expert of you yet. Comma although admittedly, Vulcan's first attempt at dealing with the situation resulted in a failure, he drove off the Elder. But then he took a force of his best men into the webway to defeat the mandrakes at their source, only to be picked off and murdered while they advanced. They got as far as Karadruark's tower, but their Vulcan ended up being the last man standing and forced to retreat. When he got back to Nocturne he smashed the webway gate to bits, regretting his decision not to do it in the first place and lamenting the loss of so many good men. A season later the mandrakes returned. Forcing Vulcan to realize that there was more than one webway gate on the planet, and that his earlier attempt to destroy their entrance as well as the counter charge were both futile actions on their own, meaning he would have to destroy each one if he wanted to protect his people. And guess what? He did exactly that. Shortly after Vault, I mean Vulcan Balam Heresy. Vulcan came first. Drove off the raiders. His settlement threw a biggest feast to celebrate the victory along with a competition to see who had the biggest man parts. Amongst the events were to be anvil lifting, weapon forging, and biggest fire breathing dragon thing slaying. Or something like that. A stranger ended up intruding on the ceremony, and proved himself Vulcan's equal in every contest except the salamander slaying, which Vulcan won by virtue of his own thick headedness and the stranger saving his sorry ass. If you want the long story filled with themes of honor and dignity read the fucking lexiconum. Vulcan pledged his loyalty to the stranger immediately after being declared the victor, saying that anyone who valued human life over victory was worth following, and with insufferable predictability the stranger revealed himself to be the emperor. The short story Mercy of the Dragon adds a little more to the story however, in that Vulcan's acceptance was not immediate upon declaring the emperor the victor. The two spoke for a while with the Emperor trying to convince Vulcan to leave his homeworld and join the Great Crusade. After hearing about his brothers, the terrors of the Old Knight and of the Imperial Truth, Vulcan put it quite plainly that as the son of a blacksmith, he had no interest in being a general or a conqueror. Pointing out that where his brother Primarchs were already great and proud generals, Vulcan only desired peace. The Emperor told Vulcan that he was utterly unlike the rest of his brothers and that was both his single greatest tray and the Emperor's proudest achievement. So when asked by Vulcan what could he possibly teach the other Primarchs, Big Amps told him that his lesson was the most crucial and that he was uniquely disposed to teach it, his humanity. 
Great Crusade. Despite being brought into the fold, the Emperor took the unusual step of not officially revealing Vulcan and keeping him closed by for an extended period of time. Quite possibly because a massive charcoal black dude with red eyes might have been too much for a puritanical Imperium to deal with at least initially. All of the initial Terran salamanders were only slightly darkened and had ember eyes, and it was quite likely that Magnus was not discovered yet, or because the Emperor considered Vulcan to be too soft and compassionate and needed some tough love or because Big Emps had a different plan for Vulcan. For a few years during the Great Crusade, Vulcan would not act without wearing his armor or traveling very far from the Emperor himself, thus for a time all people knew was that the Emperor had picked up a gigantic, nameless, emerald champion from somewhere. The only people privy to Vulcan's existence were the other Primarchs who were already discovered, and the priesthood of Mars. Vulcan was only officially revealed at the right moment, when 19,000 members of his legion were under siege by a force of over a million orcs. They were relieved by a new force of 3,000 marines drawn from Nocturne accompanied by an entire battle fleet composed of warships and war machines of Vulcan's own design, which explains what he was doing with the Mechanicum for those years. Collectively they demolished the orcs and the old Terran salamanders got to find out who their forefather was. The rest, as they say, is history. Horus Heresy. While the rest may be history, what happened after the Horus Heresy is an absolute records nightmare. Sensing that the galaxy was about to change in a bad way, Vulcan created the post of Forge Father before leaving for Eistvan, with instructions to destroy all his masterwork creations so they could never be misused in the future. The new Forge Father protested, leading Vulcan to relent, and tell him to pick out seven artifacts to remain. Whether these are the same artifacts as in 40k is currently unclear. During the drop site massacre, the salamanders took such severe losses that they were reduced to 780 battle brothers. Worse yet, Vulcan was initially believed to have been killed in the drop site massacre, although his body was never found. In earlier fluff this was a contentious sticking point, because Vulcan was also have supposedly survived at least up to the second founding. Although at that time it wasn't certain whether this was the actual Vulcan, or one of the Forge Fathers that followed him. The Horus Heresy novels cleared this up somewhat, then threw some new wrinkles into the equation, Vulcan died and lived. Like the Emperor, John Grammaticus, Mary Poppins and Elenius Pius, Vulcan is a perpetual, a being who can't be killed by any means, decapitation, immolation, asphyxiation, having his heart torn out with a rusty fork, ETC, and will regenerate from it. His first death occurred during the drop site massacre, where the Iron Warriors launched a tactical nuclear missile at the Salamanders, killing Vulcan and the bulk of the Zvi Legion. Vulcan, seemingly, survived, however, and was given over to Conrad Kurz for sick, torturous fun. He tried to kill Vulcan. Really, really hard. With a fork. But it soon turned to unstoppable rage when Kurz learned he couldn't fully kill Vulcan, so he just kept killing him over and over, getting even more pissed off, which is strange, seeing as Kurz is a murderous psychopath. One would hypothesize this would be a dream come true. One must assume Sevater and Sheng were pulling straws on delivering Kurz the bad news at this point, before Vulcan managed to steal Dawnbringer. A thunder hammer originally intended as a gift for Horus with teleportation function included. The hammer teleported Vulcan off the nightfall, though not before he beat Conrad, who had apparently forgotten it's also a hammer, to a pulp, and sent him to Macrag, where he burned up on Ray Entry and resurrected himself again. Unfortunately, the constant deaths drove Vulcan completely insane, into little more than a feral beast, attacking everyone he saw, including Rob out Gilliman. While this was going on, Xenos were doing their thing, plotting. The Cabal, a group of Xenos who believed that allowing Chaos to win the Horus Heresy would get the Chaos Gods addicted on human emotions and then be destroyed outright when humanity collapsed on itself, so they sent John Grammaticus with a Fulgurite, a piece of the Emperor's psychic lightning encased within a shard, to give to a Primarch with which to kill Vulcan, as they feared he might turn the tide of terror. However, Eldred, in an incredibly undickish move, told John Grammaticus that if he killed Vulcan, he could instead heal Vulcan's mind, allowing him to perform his desired role. After Conrad Kurz arrived on Macrag, 
after jumping off Lionel Jensen's battle barge after playing an extended game of hide and seek, Vulcan went up a shit and made a beeline for Kurs. Apparently, the full gearite could only kill Vulcan permanently if it was used by another Primarch. During the battle, John Grammaticus, in a change of heart, instead of giving the full gearite to Kurs to kill Vulcan, stabbed Vulcan with the shard himself, restoring Vulcan's sanity but simultaneously knocking him into a deep coma while making Grammaticus fully human. Gilliman hoped he might revive himself, so he placed him in a coffin, or preservation capsule, as he told Lionel Jensen and Sanguinius, handcrafted by Gilliman himself, where he was guarded by some salamanders who had made it to Macrag, who thought they might have heard a heartbeat. Before you get your hopes up, however, the coffin was named the Unbound Flame. The last of the fabled artifacts of Vulcan that the Forge Fathers would be looking for in later 40k. Those of you who enjoy speculation should be getting a kick out of this. While internally consistent, it is almost completely incompatible with Vulcan Heston's lore, which is just as canon as Vulcan lives as of the 6 Ed Marines Codex. Ignoring for a moment the question of how the Unbound Flame was lost to the Salamanders, Unbound Flame was Vulcan's name for the artifact, not Gilliman's and it's a name that predates the drop site massacre. Vulcan had no prior history of being able to see the future, and was unconscious, dead, or completely insane during any of the times when it would have made sense for him to tell Gilliman what to name his casket. Also, the coffin would have to be extremely oversized and only usable for a Primarch. The Horus Heresy novel Deathfire is based around the Salamander remnants trying to return the Unbound Flame to Nocturne, which they succeed at. So far as we know, it is not now and has never been missing. The biggest problem is that the casket was made by Gilliman and the Fulgurite and Vulcan himself were both made by the Emperor, so neither the casket nor its contents were made by Vulcan, and all 9 artifacts that have to be recovered were made by Vulcan himself. This is somewhat mitigated when one considers that Vulcan only told his first Forge Father to choose 7 artifacts rather than 9 so the other two had to come from somewhere else or made by Vulcan at some point after the drop site massacre. It also turns out that the Unbound Flame, or Amolus as it was known on Nocturne, as well as being a title occasionally attributed to Vulcan himself, was a central concept to everyone on Nocturne, the old destroying fire and could refer to pretty much anything. In Nick Kime Salamander's trilogy, the chapter believes that the Unbound Flame might in fact be the soul of Vulcan rather than a specific object. The chapter are not aware of Vulcan's perpetual ability and consider the possibility to the term could refer to him directly without them realizing, though it could also be a form of reincarnation. Even though they conclude that one of their librarians, Hazen Dakir is probably not the Unbound Flame, and therefore not a reincarnation of the Primarch, it doesn't mean they aren't correct with their original guess or that they don't realize they are hunting for Vulcan instead of an artifact. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. The novel Deathfire ended up resolving a few issues and creating a few more mysteries. After first Captain Artelis Numian of the Salamanders is rescued and relocated to Macrag, he goes a bit. Crazy over finding out that Vulcan is dead. Weird things happen and the body is briefly stolen, by whom is unknown, though current bets are on the lion, before being reclaimed by the salamanders and fast tracked back to Nocturne. In spite of Vulcan's previous resurrection powers, which were supposedly removed, the remaining salamanders believe that returning the body to Nocturne would bring him back to life, according to the Promethean Creed. After fighting off a variety of parties trying to get the body back, including a surprising turn from one of the shards of Magnus the Red, Numian is told, not surprisingly, that the story was allegorical, any resurrection was a rebirth of spirit, ideals, and resolve, not a little one. 
After getting a little suicidal about the whole thing, Numian climbs the slopes of an erupting Mount Deathfire. A rescue party is sent out to find him, or his conviction broiled corpse, but instead they find Vulcan alive and well, having ended up resurrecting himself after all. Old Earth pads this resurrection out somewhat, Vulcan awakes in a cave inside of Mount Deathfire, missing some important memories but possessing some unexplained knowledge. Having a conversation with this dick in disguise, Vulcan realizes that there is still a webway gate left on Nocturne, and that it is buried underneath Deathfire. Based on his own limited understanding of his perpetual limits, he also comes to the conclusion that his father's purpose for him is no longer to lead his legion, arguing that the Imperium already has enough generals. So he decides not to rejoin the Salamanders or the Horus Heresy, but instead travel to Terra through the webway, taking only three legionaries with him and swearing them to secrecy about his return. When he does reach Terra, the Emperor tells him, in true Grimdark fashion, that Vulcan had an additional purpose to uphold. In the event of Chaos winning the Battle of Terra, Vulcan's interaction with the Golden Throne would somehow lead to the whole planet annihilating itself, for a new world. Loyalists, traitors, webway entrants and demons alike. Whilst coming out of nowhere, it at least gives a reason for Vulcan to be on terror but not seen during the siege itself if he was acting as a living dead man switch. Critical opinions aside, it does at least explain how Vulcan was able to do things post-heresy and why information on his activities after the heresy are spotty and incomplete since at this point he had already decided to move into the background and leave the salamanders generally nonplussed. The 6th edition Codex and Vulcan Lives have included quotes from Vulcan after the Horus Heresy, arguing with Robert Gilliman about his issues with the Codex, namely the fact that the salamanders didn't have enough marines left to fill one chapter, let alone two, and a speech that he made to the survivors of his Legion on Terror, so there's hope that more will happen in the future of the, yet unfinished, Horus heresy books. But all of this hits a snag when one realizes that it could have been simply the first forge father and 10,000 years resulted in people forgetting that wasn't the real Vulcan. The Black Library novel series and the 8th edition codex confirmed his survival after the heresy, claiming that he would return to aid the salamanders from time to time for a couple of millennia afterwards and added that he bequeathed the Tome of Fire to the salamanders after warning them he had to leave on a long journey for reasons he couldn't discuss. In response, the Salamanders created the position of Forge Father, chosen from a company captain who would travel the galaxy searching for information on the fate of Vulcan and his nine artifacts of Vulcan. So far, five have been discovered, three of which are pieces of war gear used by the Forge Father. Another is a massive laser weapon used to shoot out incoming ships trying to attack Nocturne. The fifth is a downed Forge ship used to create war gear for the chapter, which, alongside their unique practices, is the reason they have so many master crafted weapons. The locations, and even the form, of the other artifacts are completely unknown. The salamanders hold that once all nine artifacts have been located, Vulcan will return to the salamanders and lead them once more. Like Lemon Russ, but with more style. The Beast Arises series says that at least 1500 years after the Horus Heresy, Vulcan was still alive and kicking, and of course he was trapped on an orc world fighting them all the time, so the Imperial Fist set out to investigate these rumors and bring him back if possible. They succeed, but he refuses to abandon the world he's on, claiming that every world in the Imperium is just as important as Terra and is equally as deserving of protection and instead rallies the Imperial forces to defeat the orcs save the world, and give stirring speeches to everyone who sees him. But not before a few clues are dropped that the years since the Horus Heresy have not been kind to him. He doesn't seem to understand what a successor chapter is, which given that he was present at the time of the second founding is pretty ridiculous unless it really was the Forge Father who spoke for him at the second founding rather than himself. He also implies that he can communicate with Dawn as he said he would tell Dawn that Corland is a worthy successor when he sees him. Though this statement about Dawn might signify the onset of madness or senility, considering that he had already been haunted by visions of his dead brother Ferris Manus during the Horus Heresy, it might instead signify that the departed soul of Dawn might still be reachable, 
considering the Emperor could psychically summon an effigy of their brother Ferris to battle demons in the webway, or it might really mean that Dawn is in fact still alive, giving fans some hope to cling to. Or he just didn't realize that Dawn had died during the intervening years of his self-exile. Vulcan appears very much out of place during the War of the Beast as his mere existence is juxtaposed against a more modern Imperium that already considers him and his brothers as something out of a barely understood myth. He then agrees to go back with Terra and take command of the Imperial response, although he leaves the actual command of everything to Corland and works primarily as an advisor. See above about him saying that the Imperium already has enough generals and refuses to present himself to his own chapter who would be dying to have an audience with their Primarch. Eventually he ends up exploding himself and the beast together, not before stating he would return in another time to help humanity in a conflict that would make them tremble. Vulcan was officially declared dead, but the Salamanders and chapter master Corland of the Imperial Fists believed that Vulcan could have survived. And he probably did, him being a perpetual and all that. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.